Hi. <laughs> Hi, B-Sides. Um, I have to make the customary apology to everyone for being the talk between you and beer. So I'm going to try not to make this um, too long. Um, yeah, I'm going to be doing a talk on um, software security, but from a perspective of hardware. Um, so I am a fourth year electrical engineering student, um, which is the reason that I've, yeah, I'm more interested in getting my hands dirty um, than finding shells via traditional paths. So traditional security and what <laughs> we are familiar with um, mostly involves network-based attacks against computers, so desktop machines or servers, um, x86 hardware, um, broadly speaking. Um, obviously, this requires, well, this is when you have no physical access to the machine. Um, so it's looking for vulnerabilities for services that are open to exploits. Um, of course, if you have the hardware, namely the screen and the keyboard, then you, th it's game over. Um, and whatever security you had on your hardware, you can consider void and yeah, it's earned and that's the end of that. So, hardware extends beyond computers and servers to things like infrastructure. So, routers, firewalls, switches, um, mostly just things that connect all the devices that you care about so much together and carry all of the sensitive important information. Um, so, what are the vulnerabilities here? Well, on the inside of most of these is Linux, which is something we're quite familiar with. Now, what's nice about hardware recently, um, more recently, is that a lot of embedded devices are running Linux. Um, well, sometimes it's a bit overkill. Um, it's the easiest way to get a product to market quickly because you can take a system it's cheap. It's, it's ch the cheapest, quickest way to get a product to market is to use something with a embedded Linux. So obviously that extends beyond networking equipment to things like IP cameras or NAS storage devices. Um, these devices also run Linux and are also on the network but are often disregarded, um, not necessarily in a corporate environment but in your home, for example. So, getting in, let's assume that all the network services are perfectly secure and not open to vulnerabilities, which is very seldom the case, but let's assume that is the case. There is no keyboard or display or any obvious human interface to get into the device. So, how do we access it? How do we exploit it and take advantage? So, a lot of hardware devices have a serial port which is a thing we're used to, well, we know from older computers when you, know, you used to use a serial board to connect your mouse or to get a terminal into a switch or something or other. Um, often these terminals expose a shell. Sometimes the shell is unauthenticated. Sometimes the shell has root privileges. And then you can essentially do whatever you want. Um, Sometimes, well, Usually these devices also have a bootloader, which um, basically handles the booting of the whatever firmware is loaded onto the device. But if you stop the bootloader, then you can control the device like that. Um, and from there, you can dump the firmware over, um, over the network. And once you have the firmware, it's essentially the same as taking a hard drive out of a desktop computer. And then, again, you have access and you can do what you want. Now that option is to connect directly to the device's firmware, which again is the equivalent of taking the hard drive out. Um, so if there is no serial port or the bootloader doesn't allow this, I've also encountered um, cases where the bootloader is a generic thing which allows all kinds of things to happen over an ethernet port which the device doesn't have. Um, so obviously in that case the bootloader is useless. So if you can connect directly to the flash chip with a program you can buy from $6 on eBay, you can, again, dump the whole contents of the firmware and you have, yeah, you can access the device. Of course, this doesn't just mean that you have the firmware, it means you have the firmware and you can change it and you can put it back, which opens a whole bunch of other interesting possibilities. Um, just a disclaimer, 
this is not specific to this brand, but um, it's essentially a white label product from China, which is sold under a whole bunch of different brand names. Um, a fellow security enthusiast sent me one of these cameras and said, there's some weird network traffic, but I can't get into the device. So maybe you can do hardware magic and tell me what's going on. So I opened up the device. Um, it did have a serial port, which you yeah, get to know how to find. Um, the shell that it presented me with was running Linux 2.6. Um, the shell didn't help me because there was I didn't have credentials. Um, and there was, um, turned out later I could find them, but I didn't look hard enough, so I went down other avenues that I was more excited to try. So what I ended up doing is stopping it in the bootloader, um, copying the contents of the entire flash, which is usually about four, eight megabytes, into the RAM, which is usually considerably bigger, and not, not much of it is used um, at that point, and then transferring it to my computer over the network port. Once I'd done that, I had the firmware image. So I decompressed it, sent the same friend the ETC password and ETC shadow files, which he um, cracked and then gave me the credentials. Then my serial port was useful because I could log in and then I could do whatever I wanted. Um, one of the nice things is he couldn't find the root password, but he did find the admin password, which was limited in some ways, but because they balked the permissions, um, I just checked which scripts were running and had started automatically on boot, found the ones that were running as root, and because the permissions were broken, I could edit these files as admin. So I, there were some basic utilities like NC, so I just added a line that opened a reverse shell to my machine and restarted the machine, and suddenly I had a reverse root shell on my desktop. Um, so a lot of the stuff is, I mean, there was nothing on the network that allowed me to get into the camera, um, assuming there were no credentials, there wasn't really any way to get in, but using some hardware techniques, I was able to get the password and get access to the device. So, like I said, the things you can do from here, once you have the firmware, you can either extract files or information. So this contain the firmware image is obviously the Linux firmware, um, but can also contain user data like Wi-Fi passwords and um, other interesting information, depending on what device you're accessing. Um, you can also modify the file system, so you can add binaries and you can replace the version of BusyBox with something else. You can add Netcat, you could add, take your router and add iodine or uh, p-tunnel and add capabilities to that. Um, you can also boot an entirely different firmware image. Most bootloaders have the option to boot from TFTP or over a network, so you could try out completely different images without actually making any changes to the device. Um, and again, like I had with an IP camera, you could add a backdoor, so have it open a reverse shell to a specific IP if it exists. Um, so, <laughs> why are we doing this? Um, one of the reasons, obviously, is research and security and investigating the devices um, and learning. Um, I've learned a lot of stuff indirectly from doing these things, not just so much about what I'm finding, but just the process um, that I go through to find this information. Um, also and adding functionality, like I said, adding different binaries to your router to make it do other things that it's not supposed to. Changing the purpose entirely, which I've also done, um, and of course just for fun, if it's something that makes you excited. Um, on so there's a um, blog by I can't remember what the guy's name is. I think it's Chris, but I could be wrong. Um, he is an embedded security expert. Some of you may recognize this website. This is a list of um, <laughs> some blog post titles that he has. So there was, in May of 2014, hacking the DSPW215 smart plug. The next blog post was hacking it again. The post after that was hacking it again, again. <laughs> Followed by again, again, again. I think he f stopped with that after that. Then there was this one, which is a newer model, obviously much later on, <laughs> which is followed shortly after when they fixed the problem that he used to hack it, um, was followed by this post. Because for the most part, vendors don't seem to care that much about security on embedded hardware. Um, I 
sometimes feel like not enough people are looking at it. But there are some gaping holes um, in some of it. And a lot of the time it's not even, um, yeah, it's over the network. It's using traditional techniques to find these things. Um, what this guy tends to do is tear the firmware apart and investigate what causes these vulnerabilities and why it's a problem. Um, he goes quite deep into it and disassembles binaries and does exciting things like that. Um, this is something I did um, in light of, well, with the intention of changing the um, purpose completely. That is called a Seagate Duckstar. Um, it's a device that's used for NAS storage. So you put your hard drive, your Seagate hard drive, in it where that logic analyzer is not supposed to be. And it provides access to your data over the cloud. Um, but you know, it's your own data and you have the storage locally. So also over your own network. It wasn't a great product and it kind of failed commercially and sellers, suppliers started selling it at a loss, but it runs Debian. Um, so once it's running Debian, it's essentially an ARM box Raspberry Pi kind of thing um, with gigabit ethernet, which is quite attractive for a bunch of stuff. And I ended up using it um, with a logic analyzer for doing some other stuff, which is completely not what this is for. And at the moment it's running a media server and a web server and a proxy and something else, um, which it handles quite well, but it was never designed to be used for that. Um, and again, that was playing with bootloader, playing with different firmware images. Um, another very um, interesting thing that I found, essentially a USB device, when it enumerates the host controller, asks it for its USB descriptors. So what she did was ask, ask it for its USB descriptors, but asked for a ridiculous amount, amount of, um, well, a huge size response, which it didn't give because it was coded properly. So this was on a Wacom tablet. So using some hardware techniques um, called glitching, basically got the got cycle um, precise um, control and glitched the power so that this processor missed an instruction or something along those lines and basically didn't validate um, the request and ended up spitting the entire contents of the flash memory out in response to a request for a device descriptor. Um, so they managed to get the entire firmware off this chip by asking, what are you? And telling it to tell, you just keep talking, like, go on. <laughs> so obviously the point increments in memory until you have the entire image. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, this has made me do some crazy things, like get excited about this. Um, <laughs> it's not exciting at face value because you can share a Wi-Fi hotspot and share storage, um, and it's got a battery in it. But what I see it as is a small platform device running Linux with a battery, a USB port, and an SD card slot, and a wireless radio, which if I can run some generic version of Linux and I can turn it into all kinds of things. It can be a tour box, it can be a download, literally anything that you can do with the Linux toolchain run on a limited platform like that. So it's made me start doing things like picking up pieces of hardware like this and trying to make it do something entirely different. Um, what's nice is if you're able to get access to the firmware directly, you can brick it completely and you can just write it back again. So I have broken this irreparably at least twice. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what it's ended up making me do. Um, yeah, so that's just a small window into what I do and what gets me excited. And yeah, my take on security from hardware perspective. Hardware perspective.